I'm Peter Block here at ACC 2019 in, as they say, New Orleans. And uh, we now have three days of a lot of trials. This is the third day wrap up with me on the far left is Deepak Bhatt from the Brigham. Kim Eagle is in the center <clears throat> from Michigan. And uh, I've already introduced myself. So off we go for the wrap up of day three. We have four trials, which we think are the most important today, or at least will be the most fun to talk about. Uh, the first one is IRAD, uh, which is not a trial, but a study. And then we have Reduce It, Declare Heart Failure, and Safari STEMI. So, uh, Kim, I'm going to start with IRAD. This is sort of your baby. Yeah. So we've, uh, we've been working on aortic dissection for 25 years. And at this meeting, we're presenting data on 9,000 patients who've had an aortic dissection from 1996 until now. Uh, this kind of uh, registry allows us to study patterns of care over time. And a couple of interesting take-home messages from this work. First of all, CAT scanning is by far the most dominant initial imaging choice these days for dissection. And the reason for that is that transesophageal echo can miss type B dissection. Another take-home message is that the, the surgery for aortic dissection has improved a lot. The, the surgery risk, the mortality for patients with surgery for type A is down to 13% around the world, which is incredibly impressive. Wow. And for type B dissection, interestingly, complicated dissections used to need open surgery to repair distal aortic complications. Now we have endografts. 30% of patients get endograft surgery now, just 6%. And that's led to an improvement both in hospital and five-year mortality. So IRAD is this wonderful resource that studies a rare disease in many centers and allows us a glimpse of how care is changing and then how we can make it better. I noticed you took the microphone away from me. That I was ripped very it cute. out of your hand. Very cute. Actually, yeah, because I'm passionate about IRAD. You know? <laughs> okay. Well, you know, I remember you gave a grand rounds at Cleveland Clinic back when I was there, when IRAD was first starting. I don't know if you remember it. I do but, remember but, coming to Cleveland Clinic, and uh, it was the turn of the century, and it was a great talk. <laughs> yeah. It was a great talk. It was a turn but of but the I've really got to commend you. I mean, you, you've stuck with this, and it's really grown. That's enormous. So I have one quick question, a serious question, and that is. Is it still true that we should, once a dissection has made a diagnosis of, move quickly? That's the question. Within 24 hours, should you take care of this patient? Well, type A dissection is, is an emergency. It's, it's now, because the, risk of, the risk of death is yeah. 1% to 2% per hour. Yeah. For type B, if they're stable, no. Uh, medical management is excellent, and then if they have a complication, then we deal with it. Obviously, if they're malperfused, they've got an ischemic leg, an ischemic arm, that's different. But if it's stable, then medical management is the initial strategy. Beta blockade primarily. Of course, beta blockers and nipride, whatever it takes, but start, get, get their heart rate down and then lower their blood pressure. Okay, let's move on. I know it's your baby, but we've yeah, got I other things Yeah, I could talk for to days about this. <laughs> there we go. So, let's move on. Okay, so reduce it. Reduce it, Deepak, your trial. This is probably one of the game changers certainly in this meeting and one of the most important ones. Tell us about Reduce It, and Kim, I want you to chime in. Sure thing, so the study was over 8,000 patients at elevated cardiovascular risk, either with established atherosclerosis or diabetes, plus at least one additional cardiovascular risk factor. The time to first event, the conventional conservative way of looking at things, you know, I presented back at AHA, we published in New England Journal of Medicine, 25% risk reduction, very statistically significant. But that's the first event. What we looked at here was recurrent and total events. So you can come in, have a heart attack, and assuming it's a non-fatal heart attack, that sort of patient can go on and have a stroke, maybe a fatal stroke, or need a cabbage, or any number of things. So we looked at those recurrent and total events, and what we found was a 30% reduction overall in total events, but breaking that down a bit was a 32% reduction in second events, a 31% reduction in third events, and a 48% reduction in fourth or more events, all statistically significant. What that translates to is if we treated 1,000 patients with icosapentethyl versus placebo for about five years, we'd prevent 159 ischemic events. I think the impressive part of this analysis is this notion that uh, the triggers for atherosclerotic events are multiple. We have multiple plaques. Any one of them might be triggered. And the traditional way of looking at trials, you blank at the first event. What you've done is brilliant, and that is, what's the wash effect? You're staying on this drug over years, and what's the potential for real risk reduction over 10 years? Right. And this is really exciting. I, I, I commend you. It's a great analysis. Oh, thanks. 
Fish oil is not dead. <laughs> well, you know, I'm glad you said that. Because yeah, it isn't it is really fish oil. Exactly. And, you know, I think that's important for doctors and, and, and patients to know. It's a prescription medicine, icosapentethyl. And if you were taking those over-the-counter fish supplements, you just couldn't get this level of EPA or icosapentethyl. And it would acid. cost you a ton of money. It would also cost you a ton of money. You get a bunch of saturated fat in those pills, too. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on. <clears throat> we have the third. Oh, declare. Dapagliflozin. Yeah. Uh, I, we were chatting before, and I said uh, to Kim and to Deepak, well, dapagliflozin should be in the water for anyone with diabetes. Is that true, Kim? Well, I think this is a study that particularly looked at heart failure, right? And in that group, uh, this, this drug had an amazing benefit. I think 17,000 patients randomized. Big effect on reducing hospitalizations and overall events. There was a sub-study looking at patients who'd had their ejection fraction looked at, and the low EF group huge benefit. I think it was over 30 percent. And in diastolic heart failure, 40 percent of people with diastolic heart failure have diabetes. Mm -hmm. And there's a reduction in heart failure emissions and endpoints in diastolic heart failure too. So it's across the spectrum of heart failure, this agent has benefit. Yeah, and it's good for peripheral vascular disease and it's good for ischemic events. I mean, it goes on and on. Deep you bet. Yeah, I mean, to disclose, I was on the executive committee, but I thought it was a really insightful analysis and shows across the full spectrum of diabetics enrolled, it reduces hospitalization for heart failure. And if you've also got a reduced ejection fraction, maybe even reduces mortality. So pretty right. good deal. Yeah, um, and Very it is. Deal. Yeah, it's an interesting drug. And I think I asked the uh, PI whether or not uh, we shouldn't be using dapagliflozin a little earlier in people with diabetes. And he was absolutely supportive of that concept. Now it's an add-on drug, but you know, I think probably people will see that it really does help. Right, though I do think it's a class effect for SGLT2 inhibitors, yep. not necessarily just specific to this one. But I do too, and I think uh, particularly for me, we've been so desperate for a solution in, in patients with diastolic heart failure. This is really a possibility for us. Okay, so as you've noticed, none of these trials have been about interventions. <laughs> Finally, I get to say a little bit, Safari STEMI. This is a great trial. So Safari STEMI... <laughs> It's a great a, acronym. I love it. Yeah, it's a wonderful acronym, right? And in fact, it is a negative trial. And that's one of the coolest things about this trial. So for years, <clears throat> we've been talking about how wonderful the radial access is, right? And all the radial guys have said, you know, it's the only way to go, safer, no bleeding, nobody gets a stroke, everything is perfect. And radial does everything in two minutes and you can go home and the patient goes home in five. <laughs> Actually, not so fast. So Safari STEMI finally did a randomized trial uh, looking very carefully now at femoral versus radial, and it turns out that it is, in fact, a negative trial. Pretty cool. There is no difference between radial and femoral, and so you have to ask, what happened to all the hemorrhage that happened in femorals? Because all the time, it was the femoral hemorrhage that made the difference right. between the two. And the answer is, we're just gotten a little bit better at sticking the femoral artery now. You know, I tried to teach Kim how to stick a femoral artery in uh, 1902. It did not work. It did not work. <laughs> but that's a sidebar. In any case, uh, the femoral artery stick has never been easy. And now I think we've learned a lot about looking carefully fluoroscopically, making sure we do road mapping if necessary, using ultrasound, all those little tricks. And it turns out, in fact, that radial equals uh, femoral in STEMI. Now, a quick word about what this means, and then I'm going to let you get to me, but the short version is... <laughs> I'm waiting to pounce in the safari. Me, <laughs> there you go. For me, if you're doing a STEMI and you get into trouble and you're in the radial artery, that's the last place you want to be. But the femoral artery gives you a lot of op opportunity to do other things, supportive therapy, putting in an entry balloon pump, putting in catheters from the other sides and so forth. So the short version is, I think this is a great trial and at least says if you're good at femoral, and you're good at radial, that's probably the best combination. So Deepak, do you want to take a shot at him before I do? Oh, sure. You know, I think um, I, I love radial and I love femoral. I mean, both approaches, I think, have value. I even love brachial, having, you know, trained in the Sohn's cardiac catheterization lab. So I, I think all approaches are good, but in part it depends on operator and lab experience and comfort. So if someone's not comfortable with radial, I wouldn't say do radial, yeah, I'd say do femoral well. So uh, there's, there's a lot of wisdom to picking the axis route that, that one is most comfortable with. But as a just practical point right now at the Brigham, for example, we're over 90% radial. And that facil even if that's not better than femoral, it facilitates things like early discharge, patient uh, early ambulation, patient comfort. So there are other sorts of benefits, maybe not on hard endpoints, but it sure helps cath lab throughput. 
I thought your interpretation of this trial was hilarious. An interventionalist looks at this trial and says, it proves that femoral access doesn't bleed much. A non-interventionalist like me says, it proves that you can get into the radial quickly and not lose time. You know, it's kind of like beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, right? But what does he know? <laughs> he doesn't know a lot. <laughs> there you go. The short version of this trial is, yes, it is a negative trial. But as Deepak points out, and in all seriousness, uh, if you can do both, pick your patients. Yeah. Make sure that you're good at doing what you do and do whatever you think is right for your patient. And he's absolutely right. The radio gets the patient home earlier. But if you get into trouble, the femoral is the place to be. Be careful, do the best for your patients, and I think that's what the American College of Cardiology is all about, trying to take care of your patients. That's what it's all about. Okay, thanks very much, folks.